All right, let's get started. Uh, I hope that the audio and everything's coming through nice and clearly. Uh, thank you for tuning in today, whether you're in person or uh, online in our team stream. My name is Matt McGrath and I'm the coordinator for Business Plus. Uh, today we have a huge treat for you, uh, an employability professional development activity. Uh, we've got someone from the outside that we have a great relationship with and we have used them before and they provide fantastic personal branding content uh, to support people with their own personal and professional development. Uh, before I get to my speaker, Emily Kuchkalich from Brand New You, uh, I wanted to introduce this as a Business Plus activity. Uh, and for those that are con using this to contribute towards their portfolio, please use this today and reflect um, because it is a, a great uh, a great session uh, that we've got to come and you, you'll have the chance to ask questions of Emily throughout as well. Uh, and that reflection is really important in your own development as well. Uh, but before we begin, I wanted to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we are on today and that you may be watching from. Um, and I'd also like to pay my respect to elders past and present and extend that to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. A little housekeeping, uh, particularly for those of you online, please keep your camera and audio muted just to make sure the stream goes nice and smoothly. Uh, if you do have questions, please use the chat. We've got people that will moderate that and we will feed that back to Emily throughout the session as well. So you'll get plenty of opportunities to ask questions uh, that pertain specifically to you. Today's session will be Griffith-centric, uh, mainly towards students, but I know we will have some staff here as well and alumni as well. So uh, no matter what your question is, uh, we want you to try and get the most out of this and take advantage of Emily while we have her here with us. Uh, and yeah, I think we are almost ready to go. If you have any questions, during or after that are not chat appropriate or personalised, you can email us at Business Plus uh, and we can always forward them on to Emily as well. Uh, and you can find them on LinkedIn as well. I'm sure they that Emily and the team would be glad to hear from you. So Emily Kuchkalich, Managing Director of Brand New You, runs an amazing array of personal development seminars and is, is really the personal branding guru. Uh, has done so many amazing things, has won an EY Entrepreneurship Award, done a lot of philanthropic uh, ventures and raised a lot of money. So much more than just a PD specialist. Uh, I'll introduce her now and then she can get straight into it. Uh, please make her welcome. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you for making the effort coming into the actual um, theatre today and those of you online, welcome. Um, please ask questions as we go. It gets a lot more interesting. I'm going to really start, <clears throat> for those of you who don't have a background in marketing, we're going to look at a bit of how branding and marketing works and then think about how that relates to you as an individual and what your personal brand is. You kind of can't have a discussion these days when you're thinking about marketing and branding without having a, a look at the past couple of years and what the changes have um, done to the way that we present ourselves uh, within market. So we look to Interbrand, which are probably the global experts in brand. Um, they publish a report every year. It's very interesting. It talks about what's happening in the world of marketing and branding. And two years ago, they published what um, in my career has probably been their most interesting um, report. And it was coming off the back of the pandemic, global climate change crisis at the time, Donald Trump and what was going on with America. And it started to say there's this massive shift in the way that we see brands in general in terms of marketing. And if you think about brands as corporate brands first, and then we'll take it down to personal brands. And this big shift was this idea that we had given up a lot of freedom and a lot of choice for the last couple of years because of the pandemic and some of the, um, of the ways that we chose as governments to deal with that. And so what that meant was that people were moving to this idea of um, essentially um, giving a, a vote of confidence, like having consent in the brands that represented them, looking for organisations and people that made them feel that they had something really in common in, with them. And, and this is only increasing as we face more and more. You know, the last few years have been quite complex at a geopolitical and sociopolitical level. So this idea that we're looking to kind of consent for organisations and individuals to represent us means that we need to start looking for um, common values, like this move really closely to seeking out to make purchases from organisations that 
<clears throat> believe in the same things we do and do the same things we do. And that is coming into the world of corporations where we're looking for individuals as leaders to represent the common values and desires and growth of the individuals within the organisation. And so actually, Sir David Attenborough's brand, personal brand, went through the roof over the past few years. He's an incredibly popular personal brand because he clearly represents something. He's calming in that he represents hope and it's like, don't panic, we can fix this. Um, and he clearly demonstrates what his values are and it's easy to connect with him. The other finding over this um, report that Interbrand put together was that corporate brands need to kind of have these three big things in order to be successful. And if you think about it, over probably the past five years, we've been getting there. And then the pandemic and the recognition that the climate is in crisis and now, of course, the war in Ukraine has simply in sped up that process. Um, so it's this idea that we have courageous leaders um, and we're seeing that right now in the Ukraine, which is really interesting when you think about personal brands. The bravery and the courage has been compelling to most of us. Um, inspired engagement, so organisations and individuals that make these big, bold, iconic moves, but equally so small interactions that are kind and empathetic um, to individuals. And then finally, relevance. People are looking to make their choices matter, um, whether that be in purchasing products from you or hiring you as a personal brand, like you as an individual. So that's kind of the big macro environment that we're operating in. The other thing that's really important, um, whether you're still studying, whether you're seeking a job, whether you're in a work environment, every single person is more anxious right now than they were three years ago. And so understanding that and understanding this need for empathy, you know, these empathetic moves, these um, interactions, this understanding of what you stand for so that people can relate to you has become heightened in a world where people are looking to find connection with others. So taking that into the kind of concept of personal branding, which is what we're here today to talk about today, um, that's kind of setting that macro level for you to think about. And then what I'm going to talk about heavily today is who you are, how to kind of create a personal brand and some of the tools and techniques that are at your disposal to improve your impact, presence, ability to negotiate. So the first thing is what is a personal brand? Um, Bezos, and, and I don't really like quoting him, but he has the best definition of a personal brand. Your personal brand are the words people use to describe you when you're not in the room. So if you start thinking about those words, the words that you want someone to say about you when you've walked out, and it's not, oh, she's clever, oh, she knew her job. It's the kind of meaty emotional things. Oh, she was really fun. She had a really warm sense of humour. Um, Gosh, I love the way she sees the world. It was really different. So it's those kind of more emotional pieces. And what happens is you want to kind of hit these three things, this idea of being distinctive. So um, one of the good things about being distinctive is if you're kind of authentic to who you are and you stay true to who you are, you will inherently be distinctive because there's only one of you. So this idea of standing out by being you. Then being very deliberate about it. So if you wind back and say, what are those words I want people to say about me when I'm not in the room? And thinking about how that person, you know, for, uh, shows up, how they write, how they dress, how they walk, giving people a really easy to understand, which is when we get to the next bit, coherence, make it really easy to understand who you are and what you stand for. We do tend to do that naturally as humans um, with costume. We tend to select clothing that means something to us and projects something, but there's many more things you can do in terms of that in, in order to make it really easy for someone to understand you. We like people that are easy to understand. We can we know who they are. We know what they represent. And um, for those of you not in the room, there's three people here in um, the Griffith University Business Plus uniform. When we see that, we know we can go and ask them where a lecture is. We know we can go and ask them um, for some brochure wear, etc. So we like it when we understand. Uniform is a really interesting thing because we understand what that person, we, we assign a number of particular skills to them and we know what we can go to them for. <clears throat> So in terms of branding and marketing and, and kind of the high-level idea of what a brand is, 
all brands have two components. The first is a functional component. So in order to have a brand, you've got to kind of make something. So on this page, Nike makes sporting goods, Apple makes um, computer wear and, 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 and phones, etc. Very few and, and certainly no successful brands go to market just presenting their functional capability. Like Nike doesn't go to market going, we make sneakers and jumpers and tracksuit pants and Apple doesn't go to market saying, we make phones and we make um, computers. That's the element that you, you kind of have to have, this functional component. The piece where we really compete is the emotional component of that brand. So there's two components, functional, emotional. The emotional component is about how that brand makes you feel. So if you have a conversation with a teenage child and you are comparing a pair of $13 sneakers from Big W and a $300 pair of sneakers from Nike, chances are that teenage child will have a million reasons why they need the Nikes and why the Big W sneakers are no, no good. Functionally, they're comparable. Chances are they're made in the same factory. So the, the, no one is talking about the functionality. The child will say, if I wear Nikes, I'm cool, I can run faster, all the cool kids, Michael Jordan, you know, that shows my age, um, LeBron James, someone else has got cool sneakers, et cetera. So it's the same with your personal brand. The functional brand is what you've studied at university, what your grades are, what you've done before, what your role is. The emotional side is how you make people feel. And what we all tend to do when we're creating CVs or we're applying for a job is we focus on our functional capability. We say, you know, I'm an accountant. I studied at Griffith University. I've worked for three years in this space. And it's very functional. When you're getting to the final round of a job interview, the chances are the three of you or four of you or however many are in that final mix functionally are equal. You're all as good at accounting. You've all done the same amount of um, experience, et cetera. The choice to choose you over the other three candidates is the emotional side of it. So, um, and I know this, I've worked in corporate world all my life. The conversation goes things like, we really like her. She'll really fit into the dynamic of the team. He's got a great energy and impact and view and will complement the organisation that we have. It's the language of emotion. It's not, we're going to hire her because her balance sheet skills are just through the roof or did you see his nested if function in, in Excel? Those things are functional. <clears throat> so what you want to do is really think about, and that's what I'm going to talk about today, the emotional component of your brand. You have to have the functional. You've got to be able to do something when someone's hiring you for a role and, and preferably be able to do that role. But the choice about you, and also if you think about it in, in financial terms, the ability to get paid more is about the perceived emotional value, the perceived need to have you in their firm over and above another person. And, and that comes at a premium, as it does with, with Nike. Nike can sell their shoes for $300 and Big W can only do it for $13. Um, so kind of peeling that back, in the same way as if you came to me with a pair of sneakers and said, Emily, let's market these sneakers, if you start to think about how to create a brand for who you are, you kind of need to understand what makes a human a human. So we do it. All the stuff that I'm going to present today here um, largely is psych research done by reputable universities. I'm not going to tell you that winners go to winners and those kind of um, sayings. Uh, and these are like well-researched and properly proven um, models. So there's a model called the five theories of self. It's the best way to think about you in terms of um, who you are and when you're trying to put together your personal brand. So it says there's five parts to me. The first is the empirical or, or authentic self, the true me. So there's parts of me I take to university, parts of me I take out socially, parts of me I show my work environment. But there's this whole core to who I am that only I know and you might call it your soul. So it's kind of the centre of who you are. Then on top of that lies our historical and cultural self, the reasons for me being where I am today. So that includes, um, you know, ethnic background, religious background, where my parents studied, where my parents grew up, where I lived, what country I came from, where I went to school, what faculty I'm in, when you're in the corporate world, what team you were in before the team you're in now. And so this, this kind of long stream, tail stream of information about you that builds up over time because it's historical. The thing that's important with historical and cultural self is biases 
positive and negative are applied to the historical and cultural self. And the reason is the human brain is a massive database. So um, I have a natural bias that I'm aware of and that I like people called Tim. So I have never met a Tim, is your name Tim? Just going out on a limb, we got any Tims in here? I've never met a Tim that I didn't like. So when a Tim comes in and says, hi, my name is Tim, I just have this predisposition of a positive bias towards that person for no reason, right? That that's biases often make no sense. What they do is they go, there's a person called Tim, brain, do we know anyone Tim? Yes, every Tim we've ever met is good, therefore this Tim might, must be good. It's very, the brain is unbelievably simplistically programmed for a whole pile of reasons. So you want to be aware of biases that can hit you, positive and negative. Obviously, positive ones are really good to milk um, in terms of influencing other people. And negative biases, being aware of the ones that people might have about you and thinking about how you might want to address those. So that gets very tricky and can get very complicated. Um, but it's important to understand that that is where biases sit on this historical and cultural. And it is. It's meant to be um, these things have happened before, therefore they will happen again. So those two things you can't really help. They're kind of, well, you, you don't want to. They're, they're what you are. They're the soul with, with a history. The next part is really where you start to have a lot more influence in terms of how you want to present and project yourself. So the theory is there's this, this self that sits on top of the historical and cultural and authentic, which is called the extended self. And it's when I start to put things on these core these core units. So when we think about what that means, that's the course I choose to study, the place I choose to work, the costume I choose to wear, where I choose to go out socially, the clubs I choose to belong to, the sporting team I choose to follow, whether I do or don't have children, whether I do or don't have a partner, who my partner is. I mean, it's, it's kind of infinite. It's all the things you start to attach to who you are at the core. And the theory says that when I choose to put certain things on me, I am projecting something that gets close to my ideal self. So um, in the audience today, there's a gentleman with some tattoos. It's a perfect example of extended self. He can't see it. where. Um, that's a perfect example of choosing to add something to the core that projects something and gets closer to an ideal self. And most often tattoos will have meaning to the individual and may or may not have meaning to the external world. And that is a really good example of this choosing to apply things to yourself. So the idea is that your extended self is very broad. I mean, this page can go on forever. Um, but it's the beginning of you starting to craft how you present your personal brand to the world. Uh, social media is an, a perfect example. The things you put on LinkedIn, the things you put on Facebook, the things you put in your CV, they're all part of your extended self. And it's in that world where we start to define how people perceive us. Now, at this point, I just want to say some people listen to this and go, I don't agree with any of this. I, I should be able to be whoever I want to be. Um, what you see is what you get. And I would just suggest to you that if that is the way you're thinking, that in and of itself is a brand. <laughs> that is a, I don't care about any of this stuff, um, you make up your own mind, is a brand. The only caution I would add to that is the idea is that the receiver makes up their own mind about you. And so you're not in control of the story you tell. You're not in control of your own narrative. So taking control of your own narrative can be much more powerful um, and compelling for yourself as well as the people that you're engaging with. So you probably want to think about this stuff in terms of how you present yourself. Have we got any questions about anything so far from the room or? Yeah. Um, so you're talking earlier about um, what you do it in their, their life. Um, and let's say in the past, maybe there were less organizations out there focused on making good choices or ethical choices. Do you see, like, do you think that there could be a risk of as we move forward into the future, if every company is talking about all these choices they're making, you know, you hear it's greenwashing, but there's also kind of people watching us. Yeah, forward. totally. Um, that, that kind of noise makes it Makes it non unique and it becomes the norm. The power of marketing overtakes individuals' ability to actually choose something that is in line with their ethics or whatever. 
Um, you don't have that much noise. Yeah. So the question, do you want me to repeat the question for online? Oh, no, cool. Um, yes, you make a very, very good point. I would suggest that, um, and this is, I actually read a psych study on this the other day. Am I allowed to swear in here? It is, it's, it's a nice swear. <laughs> um, Australians in particular, but it's a real thing. Humans have a really good bullshit detector, right? So when um, a company that has been progressively ripping up the earth, um, you know, doing things in countries where they shouldn't have done things and so on and so forth, comes out and goes, oh, we're all renewable, AGL. I'm ex-AGL, by the way, um, what they're going through right now, like, and they're now all of a sudden we're going to be green. It's like it, everyone goes, that's just not, you can't just do that. So the first thing I'd say is humans are very good at detecting that. Um, and, yes, you will see marketers just giving it a good hard crack in the hope to get um, a percentage you know, increase in market share. I think the counter to that as well is that certainly your generation as opposed to mine um, has access to a great deal more information um, because of the internet and so on and so forth. So it's much harder to eff effectively bullshit the market. Um, so I think that there's always danger and when there's lots of money, you can do a lot of things. Um, I think that we're in a space where the detection is higher and more likely to happen. And I think um, as a human, as a personal brand, we're even better at that. So when we meet someone face to face and I'm standing here going on to you about being green and then I go and hop into my, I don't know, fancy Range Rover and drive off to get on my plane to, you know, you go, yeah. So I do think when we're down at that human level, we find out, and that's why when we go back to that being authentic, you, authentically you, what I'm not saying, because sometimes people say to me, is this talk about fake it till you make it? Absolutely not. It's who are you at the core what is it you want to present to the world? And then what are the levers you've got to make it easy for someone to understand what you stand for? The upside of that as well, when it's really, when you make it easy for people to understand who you are, the right people will come towards you and the wrong people won't, the wrong people for you. So um, in my business, so I'll talk about strengths later, but my my personal number one strength is fun, humour and playfulness. And if you Google um, my company all the way through, you'll see that it's just fun. Like it's, it's not – we're very serious, but we seriously enjoy doing what we do. As a consequence, there are companies, Telstra, I'm so proud of the fact that Telstra won't hire us because they perceive it as too fun. And I'm like, awesome. You know, we're wrong for you. And there's instead of ending up in a company where you go and deliver something and the feedback is negative and you feel terrible and they feel terrible, if you lead with what you are, the right people buy it. It's a really powerful kind of idea, but it also means you've got to be okay with the fact that some people won't like what you stand for. And I think we're seeing that in the better companies and I think the old school companies that won't change will not be here five to ten years' time. Any other questions while we're... Okay. I, I kind of repeated that question in the answer, but I will make sure that happens again. Any, no, it was perfect. Okay. Um, so then talking about this concept of biases, I just wanted to touch on actually how they work. So in 1920, a man called Edmund Thorndike, who was the father of modern psychology, came up with the concept of biases. And this was the test he made to kind of demonstrate how bias works. And no one ever anywhere in the world has failed it. And it says, I'd like you to meet Alan. He's intelligent, industrious, impulsive, critical, stubborn, and envious. I'd like you to meet Ben, who's envious, stubborn, critical, impulsive, industrious and intelligent. Now, you've probably worked out the words are all the same. Without fail, everyone likes Alan better than Ben and the reason is Alan leads with his strengths. So, so human beings place an exponentially greater importance, it's been proven and measured, on what we see first. So all those things that your mum told you about first impressions count, you can't repeat a first impression and so on, is 100% true. You can undo a first impression but it's hard, so you're better off starting with a really good one. Now, on top of the fact that we like Alan better, we also apply like a, um, a bias to the negative um, elements of, of, our, of each of them. So, for example, 
We meet Alan. We go, he's intelligent, he's industrious, he's really clever, he's really hardworking. We get to his first potentially negative character trait, he's impulsive. Because we know he's clever and hardworking, we don't call him impulsive. We say he's so clever, he's so hardworking, he's firing off ideas all the time. He's just got all these great ideas. And when we get to critical, we don't call him critical. We say he doesn't suffer fools. He's so smart, he's so hardworking, he just doesn't suffer fools. So there's a positive halo effect when we hit the negative character traits. Ben, on the other hand, is envious, stubborn, critical. Most of us give up there. Most of us go, Ben's just too hard work. I haven't got time for Ben. He's really unpleasant. If we do push through, by the time we get to industrious, which is his first positive character trait, it's a sinister kind of industrious. He's hardworking at being stubborn, critical and envious. And his intelligence is a watch out, he's really smart, he'll get you kind of intelligence. So it has a sinister level to it. So not only do people like and connect better with people who lead with their strengths, we forgive the that we forgive their weaknesses more. <clears throat> and for those of you who like psych, it's called the Pratt Fall, which is quite an interesting thing. We like highly competent people who fail a little bit. Um, because we forgive them their failings because they're highly competent. So if you think about that, you want to start in the world that you're operating in in terms of looking for a role or trying to influence people or trying to get a job, whatever it might be that, that is important to you. Our new, in the new world, that first impression starts online. So most people will Google you if you apply for a job. So you want to think about what they see first and you want to start laying the breadcrumbs that tell your story. So, you know, actually do think about the things you post. It doesn't mean don't post, you know, uh, outrageous items, but just think about what it is you're presenting and that you, you know, that, that you want people to see that because they will see it and they will look at it. The other thing that I wanted to say about this is in terms of first impressions, I'm just going to ask up to the room, um, how long do you reckon it takes to make a first impression to, for someone to judge you pretty quickly? Five seconds? It's less than that. Anyone else? One second? Okay. About five years ago, with the um, introduction of fMRI machines, uh, psychologists and neuropsychologists are actually able to look at what the brain does in a way that they've never been able to do and they can connect things. So psychology is fast becoming much more scientific than it ever was in the past. And they measured how long it takes to make a first impression and it's 0 0.1 second. And in 0 0.1 second to 90% accuracy across the human race, and they think it's what makes us um, apex predators, we can make a pretty good adjust, uh, assessment of people on three factors, whether we trust them, whether they're kind and whether they have power. So evolutionary psychologists think that that's meant to be someone's coming over the hill, we're in, we're in our local tribe, someone comes over that hill and we're like friend or foe. So we have to work it out pretty fast because we've got to either get our spears or we've got to go, hey, dude, come in or dude, come in and, you know, have share some woolly mammoth, whatever it was we said back in the days. Um, so it's a little bit hard because this is definitely longer than 0.1 of a second. But if I walked out here today and I kind of came out and went, you know, hi, I'm Griffith. It's nice to be here today. Okay. In po pretty quickly, you're like, does she have power? Probably not. Is she kind? I think she is, but she might need me to help her. And do I trust her? She just looks really uncomfortable and I'm not sure she really knows what she's talking about or she's certainly very nervous about being up here. Alternatively, if I walked out like this, <laughs> power, yes, like her. Is she kind? No. Do we trust her? No, right? just the way you physically enter a room starts to set the agenda for how someone perceives you. So that's one of the things you really want to think about when you go in, um, even if you're doing it online, the way you're kind of even physically sitting will start to create in that person's head a, a story of who you are. So you can you can do that and you, you have tools at your advantage to start to think about that. And if you think about um, actors, you know, a big thing that they do, particularly um, stage actors, the first 
when they do their first um, rehearsal, the first piece of costume they wear is the shoes and it's because shoes make you walk differently. So if your character is wearing thongs, you walk very differently to if your character is wearing, um, you know, military boots up to the knee. And so they do that to start to get into character because characters, and if you watch actors, they walk differently depending on the character, depending on what it is they're trying to, to portray. So you can think about that as well in terms of how do I want to come into a room for people to... And, and you may walk in like I just did because the conversation may be a really hard conversation where I need to tell you all that you no longer have a job. So I might... Or you've all done something really terrible um, and that's why you have no job. So I might want to come in in a different way. But this is this idea that we can kind of set this first impression from day dot. And another way we can do that is to think about um, costumes. So, I mean, this one always gets me in hot water because there's always people who disagree and, and agree. Um, so, this is purely an opinion, an opinion based on 13 years' worth of research, but it is still an opinion, just as a... Yes, question? I have become pretty disengaged from social media over the past couple years. I used to post a lot, but don't anymore. Do you think that lack of presence on social media... I think that in the job environment, you must have a LinkedIn profile, particularly if, if your job is seeking a professional role or a role that, which I'm assuming it is, if it's connected with Griffith, you probably have a degree or are doing a degree. So if you think of LinkedIn as a precursor to your CV, LinkedIn is imperative. The others don't matter. So social media is a media and Going on it with nothing to say can be, you know, the number of people who just put absolute rubbish up there. Um, I would, you know, they, they would be negatively marked in a, in a job application role because it would be like, you know, 500 selfie photos in front of the bathroom mirror looking the same every day doesn't present innovation, creativity, a perspective, a different view. So social media only matters if you have something to say. Um, but LinkedIn is an absolute requirement in terms of thinking of it just like you would think of your CV. And a follow-up question, do you need to be active on LinkedIn or just maintain a current profile? Yeah, good question. Again, horses for courses. Um, active, being active on LinkedIn can be very powerful in terms of if you want to get in front of certain senior people. So LinkedIn is a fabulous, if you're a, a market entrant, it's a fabulous um, equaliser because you can reach out to very senior people in a way that you wouldn't have been able to in the past um, or people in, in organisations that you might not have been able to have access to. So again, it's horses to courses. Definitely always keep it up to date. Um, active, again, active if you've got something to say, um, active if you want to follow and post comments. Um, we are seeing a little bit of the silliness of, of Facebook and Twitter come into LinkedIn. Um, people don't like that and it's not, it's it, it's a platform that, so I wouldn't use it for a platform to wholeheartedly disagree with people in 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 um, in a nasty manner. I believe the word is trolling. Like I wouldn't use it for any of those kind of things, but absolutely for engaging with people and engaging people in qualified, intelligent debate. It can be powerful too. Any other questions? Fantastic. Thank you, Phoebe. So if we start to think about what I've got up here on the slide, you've probably all worked out the same person. It's all Kate Blanchard. One of the things we have um, at our disposal, and it's very powerful, is the concept of costume. So I'm not talking about fashion, I'm talking about costume and the costume as it relates to your personal brand or another way of thinking about it is the packaging of your personal brand in the way that you might think about the packaging of um, a, a, a product that you're taking to market. So costume tells people a whole pile of things and we have done this with large groups of people. We've paid like costume bingo and we've defined scenarios and we get to like 90 plus percent everyone with the same response. So if I ask you to look at this page and say, you've got a two-year-old child that you need to give to one of these people to take care of today, most of us give it to Kate in the middle row far left looks a bit like a teacher, looks like someone we might be able to say, here, look after my, my two-year-old for a while. If I say to you, 
you've just come into a big amount of money and you might want to think about doing something smart with your money. Most of us go to, to Kate, one from the right middle row. She's got a bank of graphs in the background. She looks like she might be an accountant, investment banker, et cetera. If I say to you, let's go out and have a really good party night tonight, most of us seek Kate, bottom row, second from the left. If I say to you, let's go out and help someone less fortunate than us, the majority of us go to the Kate in the top left corner. We don't know anything about these individuals. What we are doing is telling ourselves stories and making assumptions about them based on their costume, the way they hold themselves, and their physical background. So the physical background is really interesting in the world of Zoom. You can tell stories about yourself by whatever you put behind you. Don't put why someone has got been going out telling people for job interviews to have a plain background. Why would you do that? It tells no one anything about yourself. Um, I had a wonderful interview with a young lady recently who um, was a massive crafter, and the and she was literally in her craft room, and it was just full of like cool stuff. And we ended up having this really good discussion about macrame and um, all the different things she did. And she just became this kind of multidimensional, interesting person, as opposed to a person who was sitting on a blank wall that, you know, you make it again, make it easy for people to understand you and easy for people to connect with you. So you want to think about the power your costume has to tell people about what you can do. So when you go to a job interview, you want to think about what you're trying to tell them you're capable of and the fact that the largest part of the human brain is the occipital lobe. It's our, our, it's what we see. So we do look at things and we take what we see in very, very, it's, it's a very powerful input of data to the human brain. So the other thing that I wanted to highlight on this page too Kate's an actor and this is an acting technique and it's a very powerful acting technique. Kate keeps her mouth open when she wants to create a connection or essentially feel kind and she shuts her mouth when she's trying to put a barrier between you and, and her. And if you go off now and watch lots of movies, you will notice that they do that. That is a real, they're taught at NIDA or wherever they go, this open mouth technique. So it's a very powerful tool to use in interactions in the corporate environment because essentially keeping your mouth open keeps the connection open. So if I was to say to you, has anyone got any questions? Has anyone got any questions? You're just more likely to ask the person with the mouth open. So it's a really fabulous technique to create connection with someone um, to kind of almost force yourself to listen to someone. So if someone's talking to you, keeping your mouth open um, and not like, because <laughs> that's not going to work for you, but just gently open. And the reason is um, if you actually just kind of put your hands on your jaw muscles and close your mouth and then just let it drop open a little bit and do it a couple of times, what you'll notice is you actually use muscles to close your mouth. We're actually meant to be about here. That's like natural. And actually, I'll ask you, and the guys in the room are definitely doing this, open your mouth as wide as you can. Ah, ah, ah. Does it hurt? Yeah, because there's very few people that that doesn't hurt because we are keeping our mouths shut all the time. So these muscles are really quite tense in the way that, you know, if you're walking a certain way all the time, you get a tense leg muscle or whatever. So young children under five, they have their mouths naturally open and it's what makes them, one of the things that makes them incredibly appealing, that just sort of openness. So keeping your mouth open when you're engaging with people online or in person creates a connection with them. Equally so, closing your mouth can shut down a debate. So, um, you know, if you're negotiating your salary, if you aren't happy with it, you might say, can I have an extra 50? But if you have a definitive point, I want 100. It, it's a really powerful negotiating tool. Open your mouth, close your mouth and get really used to it and concentrate on it. Actors can teach us a lot of things. They go to uni, they go to school for three years to learn that. Um, okay, they do it very well. A couple of things, just these are like 
um, findings that have come out of psych around this idea of enclosed cognition. If you like some of the stuff I'm talking about, enclosed cognition is a man called Adam Galinsky. He is, or I'm pretty sure he still is, Professor of Ethics and Negotiation at Columbia, Kellogg, Kellogg School in Columbia. He does a lot of research in this space. He came up with this concept of enclosed cognition. And what he was doing was he, his, his kind of seminal piece of work was he got um, a group, two groups of students held everything equal. They were all put in white lab coats. One room was told that they were the lab coats of a, of a surgeon or a, a medical professional. The other group were told that the white coats were um, painter's coats. They had a 20% improvement in concentration tests in those who thought they were wearing the surgeon's coat. So what he called was there's this thing called enclosed cognition. So there are pieces of clothing that have they have they have a certain social meaning and when we put them on we can significantly we, not only do we change the way people perceive us we can change the way we perform and so it's quite interesting when you're starting to think about some of the tools you have and these are a sample of ones that they've detected a, a change in what people do so when someone puts an apron on they tend to be more aware of other people's needs and are more likely to, to be a service oriented person to try to help others um, people with a uh, whistle around their neck um, are fairer they think they look at um, two sides of things more openly than they do without the whistle on there uh, around their neck. The high vis, one of the reasons why, um, you know, large organisations that work in unsafe environments use high vis is not only can you see the people, but people behave differently when they're put in safety gear. When you, just by going through the process of putting safety goggles on, you behave more safely because it's reminding, it's this idea of enclosed cognition. Um, the crown. If you want to watch a five-year-old misbehave, put a crown on his or her head and they will literally start bossing people around, walking differently, et cetera. Um, not, a, you know, probably a bit odd to walk into a job interview with a crown on, but it depends what you're going for. Um, but that's a really interesting one. Crowns and capes. Um, if you ever watch little five-year-olds or under five-year-olds with capes on, there is nothing they can't do. It's quite lovely and I, I, I wish we could all still walk around in our Superman outfits because we would all behave very differently if we could. Um, and finally, the clipboard. People who um, carry a clipboard will get listened to more and sought out for advice more. So we had a client who um, was having some issues. She was she was a, a petite, quite quiet lady with a senior role, and she was like, people won't listen to me. And we got her to start carrying a clipboard. We said, just try this. And it was such a great prop for her. It really worked. And she was like, oh, my God, that works. And I'm like, yep, you know, whatever it is, just use it because it makes people, people will turn to you. And, and so there are lots and lots of things that have this enclosed cognition, but you want to think about them um, as you can use them for yourself, both for your own performance and also to influence how other people perceive you and, and tell your story and make it easy for you to be understood. Any questions on that? Because it's usually a little bit, there's someone who goes, should I wear a tie or not? Um, I'm sure there might be one coming through when they start thinking about it, so let me know if there is. Okay, so I just want to talk about the idea of, of, of liking now. Um, it's really important, this concept of liking, when we're thinking about what our personal brand is. And one of the things that I often talk about, people, people will use it as a derogatory um, remark to say, oh, she just wants people to like her. It's like considered a weakness. Um, I would counter that we all want to be liked. We all want to be recognised for the value that we bring. And most of us want to walk through life having a bit of fun. Um, you know, so that to want to be liked is not a weakness. It's a really weird thing. I, 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 and you hear it a lot and I always fight it. So that's the first thing. The other thing about liking is, again, back to my idea that the human brain is 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 whilst it's one of the most complex organs, it's also very simple the way it's been programmed. So we're quite um, binary in our decision-making mode. So we use subconsciously the concept of liking all day, every day. 
I like coffee. I don't like coffee. I liked that lecture. I didn't like that lecture. I like the colour black. I don't like the colour black, right? We make decisions all day, every day, just based on this binary thing that goes on in our head. So there's a man called Dr. Albert Marudian who in 1967 started to investigate. He's a professor of psychiatry at UCLA. He wanted to have a look at the science of liking because what he knew, and we still know and it's been progressively researched, is when we like someone, we're more likely to hire them, we're more likely to want them on the team, we're more likely to listen to them, we're more likely to be willing to be led by them, we will forgive them, that bias thing kicks in. So um, this lady, what's your name? Leanne. If I like Leanne and Leanne's late for a meeting, I'll be like, oh, poor Leanne, she's so busy at the moment. If I don't like Leanne and she's late to the meeting, it's like Leanne always comes late to my meeting. Um, you know, I'm really sick of it. So just we, we really forgive people too if we like or dislike people. And I love your top, Leanne. It's beautiful. Um, which is like just straight to the we like people with house compliments, which I didn't do on purpose, but that was perfect. Um, and the reason we like people who pay us compliments is not because it makes us feel good. It's because when someone pays us a compliment, basically it says, I see you. So I've taken time to look at you. I've absorbed you. So, um, you know, that was simple for me to say, I like your top. A complex one might be, I really like working with you, Leanne. Every time we work together, you're really positive. She sees that I've seen her. She's My compliment places value on something she probably values. So what Albert Morabian found was um, we, I'll jump back in a sec, but we um, like people and we have a predisposition to liking people based on how they present themselves. And it is made up of 7% what they say 38% how they say it, and 55% their physical presence. So he's doing this in 1967. We don't have, we barely had phones back then. Um, for those of you who are my age, you remember the waiting for a phone call to take 10 minutes just while the dial ran. I'm looking at you two, no one else that comes into that. <laughs> They've probably never seen one of those like dial phones except in the museum. Um, <laughs> So obviously these percentages change a little bit um, and also like when you're online, the content goes up higher um, and the physical presence goes down a little. But the idea is that these three things are really important in terms of how you present uh, yourself and your ideas. They are not mutually exclusive. That's why they're there as cogs. So the 7% or your content still matters. It is easier to get it across to people if you've got that other 93% working. And I'll, um, I'll elaborate on that in a sec, so I'll just cover these last couple of comments at things. So with back to the liking, so that's that's how liking is made up, this 738.55. But in terms of liking, and um, not surprisingly, psychological contagion, we're with Mr Galinsky again, he likes a bit of contagion, he's probably changed his words recently. Um, we... When we find that we have a connection with with someone, we are uh, we basically become like one with them, and we will we will start to wear parts of them. So, um, one of his big pieces of research on this is he got a group of students in in a room, and two of us, so you and I, were told beforehand that we had a shared star sign, and what would happen is um, if I started to say things you would just start to agree with me because you'd be like, oh, we're the same star sign. She must be right. You would even agree with me if I started to say things that were wrong. And even if you ticked a box that said, I don't believe in star signs. So personally, I don't believe in star signs. The whole thing doesn't make sense. Until someone tells me I'm a Virgo, until someone tells me they're a Virgo, and I'm like, of course you are. We've got so much in common. It's one of those really weird things. And it's because humans seek out connection. It's a really beautiful thing about us. We actually want to have things in common with people. We want to find people that see the world the way we, we see them. We're tribal and we connect and we, we don't want to exist alone. So he found this idea that we have this psychological contagion that we can eff effectively infect other people with who we are if we believe we have things in common with them. So the way to have things in common with people is to have um, common views, mutual goals, paying compliments, those kind of things. 
Then the next piece of research in this was done by um, Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman. Kahneman's the only um, psychologist to ever win a Nobel Prize for economics because he and Amos Tversky basically created what we now call behavioural economics, which is essentially the psychology of why people perform the, behave the way they do in an economic sense. Um, fascinating stuff if you're interested in it. They took this research even deeper and they found that when we have connections with people, at times of stress, they bond and get stronger. So if we're all in this room and I say, hey, we're all at you know, we're all at Griffith University. You'll kind of roll your eyes and go, well, she wasn't that bright. We were at Griffith University. It was a Griffith University lecture. But if two of us or two of you are on a bus under attack by terrorists in a, in a foreign country and someone says, hey, you two both go to Griffith, you will protect each other over and above other people because of that perceived um, connection. So it's really important to try to create and weave as many connections as you can with someone when you're trying to influence them. So whether that be to get them to do something you want, to get them to hire you, whatever it might be. So that's this idea again of being free and open with who you are, making it easy to understand who you are, having a backdrop. You know, the lady, the macrame lady, um, we ended up creating lots of connections because I was like, I love macrame, I could never do it. Can you do this? Can you do it? And, you know, she felt comfortable and then you start to. So weaving connections with people is very, very powerful. The reason I've got those badges there is things like pins are a really easy way to show someone what you what you strongly believe in and easy for someone to go, oh, wow, I see you're wearing um, an Amnesty International badge? Is it amnesty day? Oh, no, it's not, but I believe in this or I do that. So thinking about making it easy for people to understand you and connect with you can be a very powerful tool when you're trying to influence people. The other thing I want to talk about is this concept of potential. So this is a study that was done out of um, Harvard, I think, um, but it was Yale and Harvard students. Kevin Shea is a real comedian. That was a real Facebook ad campaign. When they used the language of proof, everyone's talking about Kevin Shea, Six, uh, sorry, 8,500 people clicked through to buy tickets. When they used the language of potential, 430,000 people clicked through. By this time next year, everyone could be talking about Kevin Shea. And this study is quite comprehensive. It went through scenario after scenario, and every time, Human beings place greater value on what something might be than what it is, except there is a point of saturation. So they were doing it with um, actors and I think it was like when the person finally had five Oscars, they'd hire the Oscar winner over the rookie. But it took a while because it kept being, oh, this person might be the next best Oscar winner, so I'll give them a shot rather than go with the Oscar winner. And if you think about human beings' preference for potential at, a, at your personal level, it's the stuff like when your friend goes, hey, there's a brand new Chinese restaurant, let's go try it, and you all just drop your favourite Chinese restaurant that has always been amazing, and you go, oh, no, th and the thinking subconsciously is this just might be better. So we're perpetually, again, um, evolutionary psychologists would, would say that this is a desire to be always trying to evolve and looking for something, you know, over the hill might be better water, might be a safer place to live, et cetera. So we, it's, a, it's a thing that exists in us, this constantly looking forwards. So you want to think about that when you're putting together a CV or applying for a job. We tend to run the first part of our CVs are our proof. Hire me, here's my grades, here's my achievements, here's what I've done. You want to flip it. You want to say, hire me, I just might be the difference to your business. I could have the potential to seriously help you increase sales, et cetera. Oh, and by the way, here's my track record for sales. So you still need proof, but you want to kind of have this potential piece. If you're a young graduate or someone who hasn't graduated yet, that's what you are selling. You are selling potential. Even if you're something like a doctor, I know that you've been fully qualified at university learning how to do medical things, but I know equally so that you've never actually been in a hospital on your own operating or whatever it might be. So I'm looking at all the things you've done and I'm going, I think you can do this. I am buying your potential. I think you're good for my company. I think you could be good in this role. I think you could really be the next best thing. So you want to think about using the language of potential and um, 
kind of flipping that as we go over proof. How am I going for time? Doing well? So I've got five more minutes. No? Brilliant, because you can probably work out I can talk forever. <laughs> yes. Yeah, of course. Hi. Attending virtual meetings, is there anything we need to do to be aware of improve our physical presence in the virtual meeting environment? Yes. Um, okay, I hope you can see me, but I'll describe the exercise to do. The first thing in the physical working, the physical working from home environment is try really hard to, one of the things that's happened as we moved online um, in the corporate world is we stopped having breaks between our meetings. So we go back to back, which... A is really problematic if you actually just need to go to the bathroom. Um, but B, you know, if you sit rigidly in the same spot for a very long period of time, even if you're 20, your body starts to ache and, and you show it, right? Like it, it's physically not um, like we much prefer when we, when we read people's body language, we're reading energy. So someone who doesn't have energy in them, um, makes that first impression, you know, if you get online and I'm like this, you're like, oh, this is, you can, straight away you're like, oh, this is going to be a hard meeting. So the other thing to do, so the first thing is make sure you've got gaps um, and, and be rigid with it. Uh, even if it means you book 55-minute meetings instead of 60-minute meetings, just making sure there's that gap to just kind of move. But the best technique um, is if you know where your sternum is, which is your breastbone, the bone, in the middle of your breast, um, and I'm going to show you how to do this without trying to make too much noise. If you push it out as far as you can, um, which just feels really nice, and I'll explain first and third in a second, that's exaggerated third circle, then fold it back in the other way and do that three times. Uh, you can do this sitting or standing. It's a good exercise. This is an acting technique as well. Um, it also just looks like you're stretching out your back. And then you set, let yourself settle you'll notice that you have what, what actors call an energised. Can you feel that you just feel a bit more on? It is the single best technique. Uh, it's called the sternum exercise. <laughs> actors do it in the wings before they go on stage um, and it's to get into the... So you can do it when you enter a meeting just before you're about to present. You can do it... You can actually hear when someone's on or off through a phone. So you can even do this before you hop on. And, and apart from the, the fact that it feels good and it's probably good for you, um, it just gives you that ability to be more on. Did you have some more questions, Phoebe? Uh, there's a comment from Matthew on the previous slide, uh, just saying, I'm doing biometric testing and there are no biometric testing. Might be a little bit different. For which one, the can, can physical contagion, psychological contagion? Might be a little bit and different. Then a question from David. How do we ensure we leverage personal branding appropriately, having regard to authentic leadership, the very self aware of their biases, or do all those with a good BS detector? How do we ensure leverage of personal branding? Help. How do we ensure leverage? Leverage of personal branding appropriately having regard to authentic leadership, the very self-aware of their biases or those that would be as detector. I think I, I might have misinterpreted that question. I think he's saying how do I how do I present my personal brand without people thinking I'm bullshitting? Maybe we could clarify because I, I want to answer that properly. I got it I did I'm quite sure on that one. Sorry David. Thank you. Um so the potential thing is is very powerful and we can physicalise the potential, which is here. Sorry, I'm jumping around a little bit. This is exactly what I just went through in terms of this one, two, three circle thing. Remember when I said that sticking your, your um, sternum out is, is exaggerated third circle and pushing your sternum in is exaggerated first circle. So what this is, is there's a lady called Patsy Rodenberg who is every so often there is a leading drama technique that comes into the world. There's about five of them. When you go to drama school, you learn Meisner technique and Sanford, actually Sanford Meisner was the same person. There's a there's a handful of them. Rodenberg is the, the, the newest and she's the only person who's still alive. She um, talks about the concept of presence as it relates to acting but 
she works in a corporate environment as well and Barack Obama worked with her, okay? So this stuff is kind of real. And what she did is she worked out that, um, and she actually worked out this when she was going into high security prisons in America to, um, to do work with prisoners in terms of giving them some workshops and portfolios. And while she was in these prisons, she realised that prisoners were unbelievably present they were totally on and in the moment. And as an acting coach, that was something she wanted to bottle because it's very important for actors to be, they have to be in the moment because they have to, particularly in live theatre, they've got to feed off the off the audience, they've got to feed off their fellow actors, and they have to be believable. They're presenting a story that, that's got to be compelling for a couple of hours, and you have to believe that they are Caesar or Lady Macbeth. So what she worked out was these prisoners were in the present because... The past sucked to them. That's what got them there um, because these are maximum security. They're not getting out. And so, therefore, their future was really no good either because they knew they weren't getting out of prison. And on top of that, in this prison environment, if they weren't on all the time, they could be physically harmed. So they were unbelievably present. And I actually used to work with a lady who was a warden in Australia in a maximum security. They get tonnes of training in this, tonnes of psychology training because... Um, often long-term prisoners are unbelievably good at playing you um, because for all the reasons you can imagine, A, they're probably not, you know, upstanding citizens and B, it gets them things in a very distorted world that they live in. So she took this learning and kind of started to build it and, and all the stuff that we talk about being present, a lot of it comes out of the work that she did. And what she's worked out is that we all exist at any time of the day in one of three circles, first, second or third. But we all have a natural one that we default to, that we feel most comfortable in, where we kind of operate easiest, where we protect ourselves. And what she found is we all default to either the first circle or the third circle. So people who default to the first circle will tend to be people that like to have all the facts before they express an opinion. They will rather listen than make statements. They often, in, in the acting world, they'll physically be smaller than, so they might, you know, they might be the people that kind of stand like that or cross their legs. They're in a meeting. They're happy to kind of sit back and listen. So they're, they're physically smaller than they potentially could be. They, She talks about energy. They have an energy that, like, if I'm speaking to you and I'm in first circle, I don't want to kind of upset you or make it hard for you. So when I'm talking to you, if I'm throwing what I'm saying at you, I might just kind of let it land a little bit in front of you so that you can decide to pick it up or you can ignore it. So I'm kind of making it easy for you. Um, and Patsy Rodberg talks about this concept of judgment. People who are in the first circle, the judgment's on themselves. So they're sitting there saying, I really want to ask a question, but I probably can look that up myself or I probably should have looked that up myself. So I'll just sit back. I might grab her later. So it's quite insular or inwards. Um, people in the third circle, you're looking at one. My husband, who's firmly first circle, says that my confidence to knowledge ratio is skewed. The fact that he made a ratio is a dead giveaway of the fact that he's first circle and I'm third. Um, third circle people will often take up a, more space than they're meant to. Um, my good friend Leanne was just sitting there in her bright pink shirt with her arm out like that. That's very third circle. She's double, she's across two chairs. She's actually across two chairs. She's got her coffee, her bag, her, yeah, and she's sitting, that's very third, right? quite big, they take up a lot of space. Judgment's external. So a third circle person's judging you. I'm awesome. If you don't like me, that's your problem. So it's pushed. So both of these are protective, right? So third circle people push out to protect themselves. First circle people um, shut off to protect themselves. And um, and third, so the judgment, the energy, the energy is very much kind of forward. So really third circle people are kind of here looking at the watch going, am I done yet? Yep, yep, because I'm in my next meeting. You know those people? They'll come in and go, hi, everyone. They just walk straight through. You're like, you didn't notice anyone that was in the room. So pros and cons to both. Um, 
Traditionally, culturally in Australia, we tended to favour third circle. That's changing, which is brilliant. And we're starting to see, um, you know, it's really interesting. We're starting to see the dominance of the computer science, maths, um, all of those kind of capabilities. And those people more often than not are natural first circle people. And so we're starting to see, um, I, you know, have worked at executive levels a number of times through my career, seeing a lot less third circle mouthy people and a lot more first circle thinkers. Um, like everything, you want both. There's value in both. And we can and do move between all of them, right? We just have one that we naturally default to and feel more comfortable. So I can totally be a first circle when I need to be, especially, you know, if, if I don't know what I'm talking about, I'll sit back, I'll listen, I'll engage, I'll be quiet, you know, I'll think, oh my God, I probably should know this very first circle. Why don't I know this? Why haven't, you know? So we can all be it, but we have one that we naturally default to. So what you want to do when you're thinking about influencing people and negotiating with people is get to understand what circle you're in what circle they're in. Because often when we can't connect with someone, it's because we're in opposite circles. So third circle people will have these, if you've got two third circle people having a conversation, they'll finish each other's sentences, they'll interrupt. Leanne and I'll be totally happy interrupting each other. We won't be offended by interrupting each other. It's not a problem. We'll fight to speak over each other. We'll probably freely touch each other. Third, third circle people are often, you know, and, you know, first circle person's going, why are you touching me? You don't know me. And I, so, you know, Corona sucked for third circle people because we're like, what do you mean I have to stand one and a half metres away from everyone? I want to just kind of touch you. Um, I'm right, aren't I, Leah? Like, <laughs> um, and equally so, two first circle people will have a lovely constructive conversation. It'll often take a lot less time because they don't feel the need to speak for no reason. Um, but again, they're with people that are similar to them and we're always comfortable as a general rule around people that are similar to us. So things can get a little bit more uncomfortable when I'm in third circle going, yeah, yeah, let's do it, let's do it. And the first circle person is going, but you haven't thought about the risks. And I'm like, stop it with the risks, you know. So they feel like they're not heard and I feel like they're not hearing me either. Like it's both ways. It's not always, people always think the third circle person is standing over the first, but sometimes first circle people can be really frustrating to third circle people as well. So I'm, I'm not looking at you. <laughs> I keep looking at you. <laughs> um, so again being conscious of where you're sitting and you can absolutely read third circle people through zoom what's really interesting is you can tell on a phone call whether someone is in third or whether they're in first you know when someone's concentrating you know when someone's gasping to be the first person to speak on a telephone. So Rodenberg calls this an energy, and I know it's pretty hippy-trippy, but I think it really is. Like, we can tell how these people are interacting. So the magic circle, which you've probably worked out, is second circle. So second circle in Rodenberg's description, and it's what she goes for because she wants her actors to be on and in the moment, is this idea of true equality. So there's no judgment. I'm not judging you, you're not judging me. Physically, I take up the right amount of space. When I speak to this gentleman, uh, when I was in third circle, I forgot to say that to you, first circle kind of I throw it in front of you, third circle I throw it to everyone. So it's like, hey, guys, and you're all going, who's she talking to? Second circle, the ball goes straight to you. You know that I'm talking to you and you kind of can't not react. Like even now, yeah, even now you're reacting because... It's not a pressure, but it's a connection. So you'll notice I've gone into second circle now. You can feel a different energy. The reason why people don't stay here all the time is twofold. The first is if I presented to you for one and a half hours in second circle, you would be like, that lady was quite unusual. And the reason is, and you can feel it now, I'm forcing a connection with you. I'm making you listen to me engage with me. So if I do that to you for one and a half hours, if I'm not an actor and interesting, I'm slightly unusual. It's taxing on you and it's taxing on me. So we fall in love in the second circle, okay? When you fall in love, you don't go home and go, what was that person's name? Which third circle people forget people's names because they're all thinking about themselves. When you fall in love, 
you go home from that date or that that meeting and you remember everything about that person. Oh, my God, the way he or she picked up their their food, the way they spoke about their mother, the shoes they had on, and, and you play it over and over again. Um, young people, like little kids under the age of five, when they're going, mum, mum, dad, dad, that is come out of first or come out of third and come into second. Um, little, little kids will physically grab your face and, like, kind of pull it. It's the most beautiful thing. Um, and so second circle is the grown-up equivalent of grabbing someone's face and, and pulling it. So that sternum exercise is all about getting into second circle. So exaggerated third, exaggerated first, second. And you can feel it. It's, it's this kind of I'm on everywhere. So the second circle tool, you want to be really good at understanding the three. Um, Moving forwards now, if you go into a lecture or you go into a meeting and there's someone who just really seems to have presence, watch them. They're usually in second. And that's what you, it's very compelling. We're very attracted to it. And the reason why we're attracted to it is its potential. So we're back to that. We have a preference for potential. So when I'm in third circle, right, and I'm doing this, and I'm going, hey, Leanne, great shirt. Hey, Phoebe. You know, I've called her Phoebe. Third circle people shorten people's names pretty quickly. She's like, you don't have a right to call me Phoebe. That's what my friends call me. But, you know, third circle people go there. They always go there. You know, and I'm all like this. You guys know me. You know who that person is. You know you can sit back and be entertained, right? This is going to be an easy lecture. She's probably going to get annoying, but... I don't have to do anything. She's not going to want anyone to ask questions because she's all about herself. First circle, if I'm kind of sitting quietly writing, you walk in, I go, hey, guys, how are you? You know, just take a seat, get on with your work. You know that person too, right? She's totally there. She's she's not being mean. She's just doing her work. She's not going to disrupt me. Or, But second circle, you don't know what I'm going to do. So I become compelling. I There's potential who is she? I don't know who she is. I don't know what she can do. So I'm really interested in her. So you want to get good at moving between three, you get your job in second. But, you know, don't kind of grab the interviewer's face. <laughs> or the hope might work. Any questions on that at all from anyone in the room? Does it make sense? It is slightly more compelling when you can see it in real life because you can see that physical change. Um. So just being conscious of time, and as I said to you before, I can talk forever, so feel free to ask questions. Some of the things you can start thinking about, actually I'll just go back here on this because I want to explain this a little bit more. So we just talked about presence, the 55%, that's that presence, the three circles. What are you physically doing? So in your physical presence, you've got the way I move, the way I walk into the room, the stuff I was talking about in terms of first impression. Costume is part of the 55%. And then that what circle am I in? first, second and third? What's my physical presence doing? That's 55% of my ability to influence you or make you listen to me or like me. Most of us understand that because most of us spend money, time and effort every day on our physical presence. So most of us have a shower. Most of us put clothes on, brush our hair, think about what we're wearing, think about running into a room, whatever it might be, but most of us contemplate that 55% in some way, shape or form every single day. 38%, which is our next biggest, the voice, most of us don't think about it. Unless we're actors or singers, most of us do very little about our voice. And yet it's so compelling. It's such a key part to influence people. And it's not accent, it's about the way we speak. So in Australia, we have a thing called the high-end inflection or high-rise, uh, high-end inflection, high-rise terminal. Um, we've exported it to the UK through Home and Away and Neighbours. It's a true thing. Linguists will talk about this. The Americans call it uptalk. And in, the Guardian did a study that said you're 30% less likely to make it to the next round of a job interview if you demonstrate, demonstrate the high-rise inflection or high-end um, terminal. And if you watch any of the politicians at the moment, they all do it, so it's not female-specific. For some reason, it sounds more... Um, it's more obvious in females, and I think it's possibly because we have naturally higher voices, but it's when we go up at the end of every sentence and we say, good afternoon, Griffith University, it's so good to be here, 
I, um, I'm going to talk to you all about personal branding. My name's Emily Cooch Carlich. I'm from Brand New You. Then I might hold my own hand, very first circle. Um, you don't dislike me, but you don't really think I've got a ton of authority. And the reason is because I sound like I'm questioning myself. And linguists think that it comes, it's a cultural thing. So if you weren't born in Australia, I promise you we've infected you because <laughs> we do work with people who, are, um, who weren't born in Australia and they've got it too. And it's like you've picked that up. That's not a good thing to pick up. So linguists truly believe it comes from our naturally egalitarian society and we do it to be non-threatening. So when I say, hi, I'm Emily Kucha college that is significantly less compelling than, hi, I'm Emily Kucha college That's much more second circle, right? If you think about where you want to go, with this kind of getting rid of the high-end inflection, um, we always talk about the Qantas um, air pilot's voice. They have a voice of authority. If you get on a plane and the pilot goes, good afternoon, everyone, we're just heading down to Sydney, there might be a couple of bumps, but don't worry. Imagine that voice. You'd be like, get me off the plane. No, no, it's like, good afternoon. We're going, you know, flight time of 6.3 seconds be a little bit bumpy on the way, I'll turn on the seat lights. And you're like, yeah, he's got me or she's got me. They've got me. Um, and they are trained in this, okay? So that's the first thing, high-end inflection. The other thing um, that Australians do linguistically is uh, we tend to not open our mouths very much. We don't enunciate. So there are a number of people you will meet who are migrants to Australia and they came here speaking fluent English and cannot understand. They're like, these people aren't speaking English because we're all standing there not moving our mouth and then we're high and inflecting and we're just going on and on like this. And the, even Americans, Americans will go, I'm, pardon? They're like, you go talking like an Australian in America and the Americans are like, I don't understand a word you're saying. Um, and again, true story, linguists think we were doing it to avoid the flies. And that we used to, that, that it's a very, like, it's it's a couple of hundred years old and we started talking like this and then we just all caught it. So there's things you want to think about in terms of the voice. Um, but jokes aside, there are actually four voices. There are four kind of um, vocal, linguistic, whatever, all the people who specialise in this space nominate four voices. The first three are the ones we don't want, okay? So the first is the nasal, and I'm in the right state to do this one. I don't like it, okay? So we associate the nasal voice with, uh, this is true, it's been psychologically tested, uh, slightly diminished intelligence um, is completely associated with the nasal voice. Uh, so, yeah, and also it's quite hard to listen to. So apart from if you've got a cold, try to not have a nasal voice. You, someone will think, oh, I can't help it. You absolutely can. So the way I got my nasal voice, and if you just try it, you literally throw your voice there and you can feel the vibrations. Um, again, actors learn all this. You can throw your voice around your body and it will sound differently. The next one's the chest voice. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. Um <laughs> Traditionally in Australian culture, it is a male voice. There aren't many women who will naturally lean on the chest voice and it tends to be that, I, I forgive me, I'm going to get the, the sport team. What are you? Brisbane Lions. Ooh, the Lions. Oh, Maroons. Ooh, the Maroons. You know, it's that real, ooh, ooh. Um, Did I get it right? Was that the wrong name? <laughs> I don't do sport, sorry. I've got a couple of teams, right? Titans, they're from up here somewhere, aren't they? Gold Coast. Um, so that chest voice, you're going to love it. You're going to love it. Trump, one thing I'd say about Trump, whatever you believe in him, he absolutely understood the 55, 38, 7 rule. He relied on the 93%. He physically wore clothes that were too big for him to build his 55%. He lied about his height. He told people he was taller than he was, which was all part of building that 55%. And voice... You know, he really uses that voice and it's very authoritative in certain environments. The last voice is the head voice. Hi, how are you? 
Kim Kardashian, um, or, you know, hello, customer service, can I help you? You're like, yeah, can I speak to your manager, please? We like the head voice. They're kind. The head voice is kind, um, but it's not a strong voice of authority. And, again, it's not. And the reason why all of these voices have diminished authority or authenticity is because they're not body voices. So the voice that we love is the body voice, which is where the body sit, the voice sits in the diaphragm. And the reason we like that and we trust it is because it's properly in me. So I haven't, it, there's no artifice to it. And so you trust a non-artificial voice. It is more believable. And in fact, I was watching a fascinating YouTube video by one of the vocal experts in the world. And he was saying that your best voice is your morning voice. And the reason is, because again, this goes back to muscular tension. We all have a really loose voice in the morning because we haven't put any tension around how we how we're holding ourselves so the the chest head and nasal voice are all muscularly tense we've done we've kind of tightened up so the morning voice is your best voice your even better voice is the morning hungover voice okay and it's because you've got literally no tension and there's a number of famous actors Oliver Reed um, Laurence Olivier who used to go on stage drunk and they claimed it was because their voices worked really well. <laughs> Not suggesting you rock up to an interview drunk, but it's that kind of the reason why the alcohol is because it's it's freed up all the muscular tension. So it's this idea that I've got and, – and what we think of as confidence is someone who is physically comfortable in their body. What we read as confidence is a person whose physicality – lacks tension because when we read tension we read something else and that's what we read so <laughs> the other thing that I just wanted to highlight too particularly because the chances are there's lots of young people in this room or online is a new linguist linguistic phenomenon it's largely in people aged 30 and below, that kind of generation is this thing called a vocal fry and they've, they've started doing studies on it they absolutely 100% attribute it to the Kardashians. And psych research has shown that people who demonstrated are considered significantly less intelligent. And it's when we fry how we talk, like, so, like, I came up here to kind of, I'm going to high and inflect as well, I came up here to kind of talk to Griffith and then, like, I might, like, stroke my hair um, about personal branding. So the thing with vocal fry is it's tribal. So you will know, you, all of you will have a friend that does this and that's all cool, right? Do it, at the, do it when you're in a social environment. Be conscious it's not a voice of authority and be conscious that our bodies just get very good at habits. So if you start talking like that, it's very hard to stop talking like that. The slightly older version of vocal fry is the kind of purr and trrr. Hello, I'm Emily. How are you? You know, it's like no one likes that person either. Um, the, it, and it's this frying thing because we like um, words to, to end. So I'm going to end. I've got three, four minutes. Have we got any more questions, Phoebe? I won't call you Phoebes again. <laughs> Okay, one for the end. I'm going to end on this slide because this is a, a fantastic tool for influencing people and thinking about your voice, is this idea of when you have to talk to someone, whether you're presenting like I am today or one-on-one -on -one having a meeting with someone, the idea is you want to present all your information with one thought, one breath. And if you're presenting to lots of people, it's one thought, one breath, one person. So that's a really good tip to know because often when we get put in a position where we have to present to a lot of people, we don't know where to look. So when you deliver each thought to a different person, it's very second circle. It makes people have to watch you because they don't know where you're going to look next. Um, and it also brings each member of the audience in. Now, the reason why one thought, one breath is really important is this is I find this unbelievably fascinating. When I'm speaking to you, when I'm imparting my knowledge or some kind of information to you, you cannot 
your brain cannot literally press return or compute or understand that button in its head. It can't do that until you breathe. You breathe, right? So every time you breathe, your brain will kind of go boom, boom, there's a bit more information, boom, boom. And you can't breathe unless I breathe. So watch this. <sighs> Who's holding their breath? We breathe in unison. So if I stand up here and I deliver my lecture and I go, good afternoon, Griffith University, so good to be here. My name's Emily Cooch Kalich. I'm from Brand New You. I'm going to talk to you all about personal branding and you cannot compute until I stop. So those people, you know, it's like I didn't get any of that. So my last name can be quite hard. You know, it's not it's not a, um, a traditional English name. So if I walk in and go, hi, I'm Emily Cooch Kalich. I'm from Brand New You, every time people say, what was your last name? If I give it one thought, one breath, hi, I'm Emily Cooch Kalich. I'm from Brand New You. Everyone gets my last name. So when you're trying to impart knowledge, particularly if it's complex, you have to make it easy for the other person to receive it. And the way to do that is one thought, one breath. And it, people could say, oh, it's slowing down. It's not. It's it's being, it's the voice of authority. It's the voice that the um, the Qantas pilot uses. One thought, one breath. It's calm, it's in control, it's authoritative, it's interesting, it's compelling, and it's not like an onslaught of just a person just kind of throwing words at you. So on that note, I might stop. Uh, we've got a question, Phoebe. Yes, it's on uh, personal experience from CJ. I've had comments about the colour of my hair and this has created a personal dilemma on whether to change it to fit in, but my customers and people I work with remember me because of my hair. The career I'm looking at, I've been told it won't be accepted. I'm stuck on whether to agree or disagree with it. Okay, so I'm going out on a limb, CJ, and assuming you've got a non-natural hair colour, um, and it goes back to being authentic. If that matters to you, stay there. It's a differentiator and, you know, people can't tell you you won't fit into an industry. Industries are huge and there will be people that will be actively seeking people with pink hair because it shows that they think differently. So, again, do you really want to be hired by the person that wouldn't hire you if your hair was the wrong colour? I would say no. And I get it. I get we've all got to pay rent and sometimes, you know, that's not going to work, but I'd give it a good hard crack with your crazy hair first, and then if you suddenly have to pay rent, maybe adjust it. But I think the world's changing with that, and whoever's telling you that um, perhaps is more old-fashioned than they should be. Yeah. Any other questions in here, guys? Um, yeah. Uh, earlier you were talking about tribes and kind of tribalism and the tribal creatures. Um, Given the scope and the level to which those tribes can grow to today, um, unbound. Thank you. Kind of physical, because it comes from yep. a number, number, there's no physical governance or consequences. It's not an in person tribe. Do you think there's room for, like, or have you heard of another word, another. Oh, huh. yeah. Because it's an online, we're all saying we're part of a tribe and there's this divisiveness at the moment. Tribalism is on rise. Like, do you think there's room for it? Like, I don't know, hyper tribe or something? Yeah. Because it really isn't the same thing. We call it a tribe because there's millions of people. It's not. It's humanity. So the question was, um, tribalism is on the rise. Is there another word because tribes are getting larger because of the way we can connect? And is there a word like hyper tribe? Um, yeah, I haven't thought about it. It's a good point. I suspect... What you'll see, though, is, and, and, you know, the word tribe, like everything, especially in the current world, words have so many double meanings and different people take them and use them for and against you. The concept of a group of people who connect for whatever reason is universal and I suspect will never stop. I suspect we're fundamentally coded to do that and there would be minds bigger than mine that could explain that. Um, but there's lots of research in that that says that there's these, this universality towards that and it's protectivism and making sure. So I suspect when you get to your hyper tribe, you'll then just have within that hyper tribe little groups that's factions within the hyper tribe. So I suspect it'll go and then come back. You know, because humans are very cyclical. Yeah. 
But also, I would I would contend that you can be part of multiple communities. Like I certainly am. Like I believe in this, and there's a community for that. And then I believe in this. So I might believe in you know Greenpeace and doing something about climate change. Then I might believe in God. So I might be part of my particular religious group tribe. And then I might be within that my particular church. Then I might believe in I don't know. Give me something else. I, you know, I might love cooking, so I might be in a cooking. So I would, I would say you can be in multiple tribes or communities. Community is probably less ferocious sounding word. I think with the evolutionary stuff you talk about, it's quite fascinating. Yeah, me too. It's endless, and I don't know. You know, but you've got me thinking now. I'm going to go and research that. <laughs> Thank you very much, especially those of you that came in today. I really appreciate it. And thank you uh, for those of you online for taking the time out to listen to me. I hope it was useful um, and I really enjoyed it. So thank you very much.